Hello, and thank you for joining us today. So we are doing another Faculty Friday. Um, today, I am joined by Dr. Alana Solomir for Criminology. Um, she is a part of Interdisciplinary Studies, the department. Um, I'm also joined by Patrick Carr. He is an International Recruitment Officer. And my name is Jordan. I am the International New and Social Media Officer. So I'll introduce myself, and then I'll pass it off to Patrick, and we'll go down the line for a little introduction. Um, so I've been at Lakehead for over a year now, um, working full time. And then before that, I did my undergrad in business here at Lakehead. I did a marketing major and a human resources minor. Um, I am now working in international enrollment to help oversee some of our online presence and our digital recruitment efforts. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Patrick to introduce himself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Carr. I'm one of the recruitment officers here at Lakehead University. I am also a Lakehead alumni. Uh, did my Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science at Lakehead and uh, I've been with the university uh, for about eight years now uh, in a variety of roles. Um, and I'm happy to be here today. And my name is Alana Sonye. I'm the Criminology Program Coordinator at Lakehead University. I am an assistant professor here as well. I got my PhD from Queen's University and uh, previously attended the Ontario Tech University and worked at uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago before joining Lakehead in 2018. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. I do appreciate you taking your time to chat with some prospective students, um, some of our applicants, so they can learn more about the criminology program, whether they plan on doing that as their full degree or whether you're just simply interested in doing it as a minor. Um, there's several options to complete some criminology courses. Uh, so I'll chat with you today about sort of what we're going to cover. Um, we're going to do a full program overview. We're going to chat about the areas of study within the program. So if you are taking it at a full time and you're doing the full major degree option, uh, sort of the thematic based areas that you'll be studying within criminology. We'll also talk about course selection, industry relevant courses, some of the really up and coming courses that are quite popular students, um, experiential learning opportunities, student research opportunities. As well, we'll wrap up today uh, chatting about career outcomes and continuing your education after the criminology program. Um, but to, before we get into things, I did want to chat and just give you a, a brief introduction to the schedule and the procedures with the webinar. So if you do like what you're seeing, of course, uh, we hope you do. Uh, don't worry, we'll be sending a recording out at the end of today and you'll receive that recording so you can watch it after. Uh, if you maybe have to leave at some point and you, you miss the ending or you join later and you miss the beginning, you can of course watch that recording. Um, or if you just want to watch it a second time and hear us chat one more time, get more details, feel free, all the power to you. If you do have questions throughout the webinar, we do encourage you to use the Q&A function. So the Q&A function allows you to submit your questions directly to us. Um, and then we can filter them through and we'll be answering plenty of them live, but we also do have Lakehead experts behind the scenes. So we have a few of them answering live uh, behind the scenes. So if we don't get to answer it by chatting like this, uh, rest assured that we will answer by text. And last but not least, um, we do encourage you, of course, to stay connected with us, stay updated uh, by following our social medias. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. Um, for our viewers from China, we do have a Weibo, a WeChat, a Yoku. Um, we're pretty much everywhere on the social media front. But I do encourage you to follow those social medias for regular updates about future webinars, as well as just getting a sneak peek at the inside scoop of Lakehead University and what the student experience is. Uh, so I know, <clears throat> Alana, we, we do have a few questions and we, we talked about the structure already for today's webinar. So uh, maybe we could go over kind of the program overview and a general structure of uh, criminology and how it works in with interdisciplinary studies. Absolutely. So the criminology program is housed within the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies. Um, this is just a convenient way that students can access a broad range of courses that fall outside the scope of criminology, uh, but that they may be interested in. So interdisciplinary studies includes people who are housed within, cross-appointed really, with uh, English, media studies, history, um, 
sociology, psychology, uh, and then we have uh, specializations that people are encouraged to take that include um, physical sciences like anthropology and biology, for example. So it just offers students a really large range of courses outside of the criminology realm. Now the criminology program um, is one of the largest programs that operates on the campus that uh, it is situated on. We're on the Aurelia campus as opposed to the Thunder Bay campus. It's a beautiful intimate campus um, and because of the fact that we're a very large contingent on that campus, uh, it's a great way to be able to actually have a very um, diverse program in a very intimate setting. So for example, we have over 30 criminology courses that students can choose from. Now in the course of completing your criminology degree, it's always, well, it, it's um, a full program in that it requires a total of what's called 20 FCEs. Now, I don't really wanna get students confused who are coming in. Um, let's just say that over the course, if you were to complete this program over four years, and you completed courses on a semester basis. There are some full year courses, but if you completed each course on a semester basis, you'd complete 40 courses to get your criminology degree. So that's 10 courses a year, generally spread out as five a semester. Now, within the criminology program, we start you off right in first year with two criminology courses, each that are a semester long. So you have to take introduction to criminology and you have to take introduction to criminalistics. Criminology is an overview of what's the field and what's the criminal justice system and how do we start to think about these processes rigorously and scientifically. Criminal, criminalistics is getting into what you might be interested in if you like that sort of CSI type of thing, getting into the forensic element of crime scene investigation. Now in second year, you have two more required criminology courses. You have to take criminological theory, which builds off your intro to crim course by focusing on particular theories that, or well, the range of particular theories rather, that uh, inform our understanding of crime, deviance, and impacts of crime on society. And then there's introduction to criminological research methods. Actually, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It's just criminological research methods. Uh, that's a course that I teach and it focuses on, well, how do we actually test these theories that you learn about? And how do we build empirical evidence, so actual uh, factual information about our understandings of crime and effects of crime in society? Third year, and you'll notice along the way, well, geez, there's a lot of other courses that I uh, don't know what I'm taking. That's because we leave a lot of opportunity for you to fill in the blanks with courses that you're interested in. We offer a diverse array, array of um, electives that you start taking at second year in criminology, which we can talk about a little later. Third year, again, you continue on with electives that most interest you. There's no required crim courses that you have to take in third year. The next time we have a required crim course shows up in fourth year, and this is called professional field exposure. And it's a course that we've actually just newly developed the intention is to um, connect students with possible job opportunities after they leave their degree. So not just putting you in a field placement and saying, all right, well, let's see if you like this, you're there for 12 weeks, but instead bringing practitioners into the classroom, a new one each week to introduce you to a range of possible career opportunities and also network with those uh, practitioners and your peers, because that's a great way to think about uh, leveraging the university experience as well, the relationships you build with your peers. So that's the required structure of the program, and I'm sure we'll get more into the details of the elective components. Sure, yes, we will. And we'll also chat a bit about the different areas of study in those thematic-based areas. <clears throat> so uh, could you chat about the degree options? I know that you can do your honors, bachelor of science with a criminology major. Yep. Uh, you can also, there's the pathway program, and then there's the bachelor of uh, a Bachelor of Science with a Criminology major, which is also four years. So could you maybe yes. chat about the differences between those? Absolutely. So if you're a first year student coming to Lakehead University to do the CRIM program from year one to year four, you will come in to the Honors BASC Criminology program. That's kind of nice. There's something important to note there. Many criminology programs that you'll see in Ontario and across Canada are BAs, Bachelors of Arts. 
The Bachelor of Arts and Science, it has to do with the additional components we have in our program that are connected to our health sciences field. Um, that's the reason we're able to label it. It particularly comes down to our criminalistics focus in many cases, but that is something that you have to understand as a student that you can sell as an additional quality that you earned in your degree. Certainly a Bachelor of Arts is impressive. A Bachelor of Arts and Science is something that you're able to say that I had this bit of extra experience that I'm able to leverage. This is something that I wanna make use of for a student. Now, um, when you come in, you, I mentioned the honors and you'll notice we heard the distinction of the non-honors four-year degree. The requirement is, is that when you get to fourth year and are ready to graduate, you completed all your degree requirements, you need to have a 70% overall average in your criminology courses. So just across all the crim courses you've taken, you need to have maintained a 70% average, and that gives you the honors in your degree title. If you have had challenges and you've been unable to maintain that 70% average, but you still have completed all of your degree requirements, so you finished all of the 40 courses and picked all the boxes you needed for your crim major, for example, that you would default into the non-honors option. So that's how that component works. The other type of degree entry option we have is the college transfer. And so this is for students who have already completed a college diploma. Um, we have a number of specified pathways with Ontario colleges. Um, the biggest example is probably police foundations. So students have completed a police foundations diploma at a college in Ontario, uh, and they now are interested in going on to university. We give students automatic credit for these programs that we've already assessed, such as police foundations, and said, all right, you get this much credit for completing that and then coming to us. And the specific amount of credit is that in terms of needing these 20 FCEs to complete your degree, you get six from already having an existing college diploma. So if you go back to the idea of, well, I need 40 courses, essentially that means you've been given credit for 12 courses. And we let you know which 12 those are, and then you just complete the remainder of the degree requirements. Awesome. Well, thank you for clarifying the difference between all those and the uniqueness of the Bachelor of Arts and Science within our criminology degree. Um, so now it kind of moves on. Um, I'll take this opportunity to remind our viewers if you do have any questions for Alana um, or if you have any questions in general about uh, your application, admissions, general Lakehead questions. We also have Patrick here, of course, who is a seasoned recruitment officer, uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions too if I can. Um, so you can use the Q&A function to do that. If you are watching on Facebook Live, you can also comment. We have our Lakeheads, uh, Lakehead experts behind the scenes answering those questions. If you're watching this after the fact, please, I do encourage you to comment on the video, and our, our team is monitoring the recordings after the fact, so we're always answering those questions. Um, if you do want to reach out to us directly and send us an email, our email is welcome at lakehidu.ca, um, and we'd be happy to maybe give you some more detailed answers or more specific, um, <clears throat> if you have very specific questions, we can also answer those behind the scenes. But like I said, I do encourage you to use the Q&A function. So I, I saw one pop up. I'm gonna head over there and see what it is. Um, so I'll pass this one off to Patrick. Um, the question is, I wanted to know if there's any update on the fall semester intake. Yeah, so I, I assume that this question is related to the current state of the global pandemic. Um, the answer right now is, is still that we're, we're assessing and we're, we're evaluating regularly. Um, we're, we're encouraging all of our students to continue their applications uh, as they normally would for the 2020 fall intake and no decisions have been in, have been made at this time um, in terms of whether or not what how the method of instruction will be on going forward uh, in terms of in person or online classes. As an institution, we're really hopeful that uh, things can uh, be taught in in person in the fall and and we want our, our applicants to be prepared for that and the only way to do that is to kind of push your application forward planning uh, to attend as you normally would as decisions are made um, 
by Lakehead University that we notify all of our applicants by email, but for the most up-to-date information uh, is obviously still at the lakeheadu.ca forward slash about forward slash Corona uh, virus. Did I get that URL right, Jordan? Yes, you did. I've said it probably a hundred times in the last couple of weeks. So <laughs> it's just like green there. But yes, you yeah. did. Right. Yeah. So um, just uh, just keeping in mind that that's where the most up to date information is posted in terms of um, decisions being made uh, university wide. Um, so no, no changes yet. Um, and as soon as there are uh, information, you'll be the first to know. Awesome. I can also pitch in from a faculty side of saying that, you know, we obviously did have to transition to online um, instruction for the remainder of our last term and that was something that is unfortunate when students have signed up to complete an in-person lecture experience but we were able to certainly manage that very effectively through platforms just like this zoom where we're still meeting on a regular basis we're still able to connect um, so certainly I echo the sentiments that we encourage you if you're interested in coming keep that application moving forward because we will press through this and ultimately at some point be ready to be back in classes together. Awesome, thanks so much uh, to both of you and also to chime in and add to that. Um, I've actually heard directly from quite a few of our upper management team and we've heard reports that by all means, students are being very receptive to the online learning. Um, and faculty are pushing through, they're, they're excelling with this. Right now we're in uh, an exam period and final assignments. Uh, so we have a few more days of that. I believe there's about a week left until uh, exam should wrap up, final assignments should be coming in. Um, and then we're gonna be moving into the spring uh, courses and those have already been moved online and are in the process of preparing for that. Um, to echo exactly what Patrick and Alana said, uh, of, of course, as an institution, we do hope to have in-person classes as soon as possible. Um, but rest assured that we will inform you um, when we do make decisions, but also no matter what, the fall semester is going to be moving forward. Um, and we will be offering courses throughout the fall. So there should be no concern there. Um, as an institution, we've also doubled down and backed up that if you do make commitments to us, so if you make any payments for that confirmation deposit, or if you make tuition payments, and if there are issues with your visa, if there are issues with getting or reaching Aurelia or Thunder Bay, um, that your money is secure with us, and that we will be, uh, we can push it to the next semester, the next entry period, um, and we're working on an individual basis with students. So if you do have any concerns about your application specifically, I do encourage you to reach out directly to either the undergraduate admissions team or graduate admissions team, depending on what level of study you're pursuing. Um, and they are working with applicants individually to ensure that if there are any questions or concerns arising for their application, we can answer specific to you. So then you have, feel confident in knowing that we're here for you. We're here to support you through this process. Awesome. Well, I'm going to jump back to our regular scheduled questions here. Um, and I was going to ask you to chat about kind of, I, I, I imagine that some of our viewers could be intending on doing the full degree and majoring in criminology, but we also have a, an option to do a minor in criminology. So maybe speaking to how students could do the minor in criminology and also speaking to how students in Thunder Bay can do criminology courses. Yeah, absolutely. So the minor is an excellent option for students who um, are based out of Thunder Bay. The requirement for the minor is that you complete a total of three FCEs out of the required 20 that you need to get whatever your degree is, that four year completion frame. Um, and there are some specifications about what those need to be. You need to take the first two, uh, the first year courses, the two first year courses, sorry, Intro to Crim and Intro to Criminalistics, but those are both offered online every single year, often multiple times a year. Uh, and then you need to take two courses at the second year level. Again, every year we offer multiple online courses at the second year level. And then you need to take two courses, so one FCE of third and or fourth year courses. 
and again every year we offer those online so that would be the way that you would complete a minor from thunder bay if you were in aurelia of course you'd have the option to take all of those courses in person as well so any course that we offer online is also usually offered in person uh, so that is something that you can choose based on what suits your learning strategy or your um, lifestyle best the distinction with the major is that when you think about all right i need to complete 20 fces in terms of semester long courses remember that's 40 courses 7.5 of those 20 fces are labeled criminology courses so you can see this in our degree requirements and this is actually posted on the criminology website uh, for lakehead university uh, on that website there is uh, a link to a sort of worksheet that i've created that lists all the degree requirements in more user-friendly format so you can take a look at what those specific crim courses are there now what that kind of equates to if you're thinking about it again in terms of the 40 courses that would mean that 15 of your courses are specified CRIM courses. But remember, as I mentioned, we do have many more than 15 CRIM courses. So many students end up taking a much larger number of CRIM courses and completing them, the degree as their major. Awesome, and I can kind of echo that in my own experience. Uh, it wasn't in criminology, but it was at Lakehead in business. Um, just having having uh, the required courses and the minimum courses that you have to take um, but then also just I have a passion for business as you can imagine um, and so I decided that I wanted to take more business courses so I had those accessible to me so students that are in criminology or for matter of fact for any program but maybe have an inkling towards a criminology course uh, to reiterate the minors are available the majors are available for those that choose but then there's also just the students that need to fill up their their calendar to be enrolled full-time and they want to do something on the side as a passion so those courses are very interesting um, I had the opportunity to go down to Aurelia earlier this year and meet Alana in person and also meet some of her students and a few weeks ago we actually did an Instagram live with um, a current student who is studying English as well as criminology as a minor. Um, and she's loving the course so far. She's, her name is Kavya and she's from India. Um, and she absolutely loves the course. And she got to explain kind of how uh, her passions for English and also her interest in criminology is gonna tie into what her end career outcome is going to be and what she hopes to get out of the program. So it's really interesting for sure to see how you can mix different programs and different passions to kind of craft what your education path is, but also potentially what your career outcome is going to be. So next, um, we'll take the opportunity to chat about the areas of study. So I know there's three thematic areas that are focused on throughout the entire program. Would you be able to speak to those three areas? Absolutely. So one of the big areas that already existed in this criminology program before I joined was a focus on social justice topics. And so we're thinking it there about how um, particular intersections in identity, for instance, gender, race, are associated with patterns in uh, crime, but also you know, responses to crime, the idea that we see um, in Canada, for example, uh, an overrepresentation of Indigenous persons in our criminal justice system. So having courses that specifically ask students to critically think about the way in which the criminal justice system um, needs to be mindful of social justice concerns. That's one area of thematic focus that you can see across a number of our courses. For example, uh, gender and crime, women in the criminal justice system, indigenous issues in relation to criminal justice, as some examples, race, ethnicity, and crime, another course we offer, um, there's others. A second major area of focus that was very important to me uh, and that we really developed as of 2018 was around the criminal justice system. So having a very consistent stream of courses throughout the completion of the degree program that focus on a student understanding the nature of the criminal justice system in Canada. And by that I mean you've got police on the front end of that criminal justice system. So we have policing courses, which I actually teach a major area of my research focus is policing. 
The second major criminal justice institution we think about is the courts. Um, but we also think about when we become more familiar with our criminal justice system, not just the formal courts, but also alternative sanctioning mechanisms like restorative justice. And so, for instance, we've developed a restorative justice and mediation course that follows up that's a fourth year course that follows up a third year course uh, focused on prosecution and sanctioning, which introduces students to the um, detailed understandings of the, the court system that itself follows up on an introduction to crim course you take in first year, which talks about the overall view of the court system. And then the third component of the criminal justice system that we really think about is corrections. So uh, we have a corrections course that students are uh, encouraged to take as an elective if they're interested in that stream in third year. Uh, in fourth year, we have a course that continues to talk about corrections, but also considers the social justice component. It's called the politics of incarceration. Now, the last stream, we've talked about two so far, social justice and then uh, legal institutions or the criminal justice system as a whole, practitioner focus. The third stream is focused on criminalistics uh, and or forensics. These are often used interchangeably. Now, in many criminology programs in Ontario, you will not see uh, much in the way of a focus on criminalistics. I did my undergraduate and master's in criminology and never had the opportunity to take those sort of courses. As I already mentioned, it's a required component of our program that you start with in first year. If it's something that you find interesting, you are encouraged to continue on with it. Other courses that we have that stay in that vein uh, are death investigation. That's a permanent course that we offer every single year uh, as an elective that students are encouraged uh, to take if they find it interesting. But then other courses that we offer in conjunction with other faculties like forensic psychology, forensic anthropology, and in fact, we have a number of excellent anthropology cross-listed courses, oh, sorry for that, <laughs> that uh, get students who are interested in these more forensic elements, something like, for instance, uh, identification of persons based on teeth, things like that, that students can continue with. They just need to really reach out into our anthropology department's programs. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you so much for giving such a good explanation of all the different facets and the areas of study. I personally think some of those were super interesting and I'm kind of jealous that I didn't really explore that option in my undergrad, but hey, I'm here at Lake and I'm working. It's not to say that I couldn't look into online courses uh, to continue my education and explore some of those paths. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so now that we've covered kind of uh, some of those key courses. Could you also talk to some of the most popular courses that students pick and then maybe some that are really industry relevant or cutting edge in your opinion? Sure. I think that when students aren't, when students aren't in the CRIM program, uh, really popular choices are our intro to criminalistics. We do have a very rigid structure, in fact, that we've imposed relatively recently of prerequisites. Uh, that's important for you to understand if you're thinking about coming in to this crim program as a major, because what it means is that now, when you get up into your upper year classes, they're predominantly filled with other criminology majors. And I'll just take this opportunity to mention that that lets us keep our course sizes very intimate. So first year uh, is a very large class size for what you usually see at Lakehead University. We have 120 student cap in our crim program courses at first year. In second year, that lowers down to 80 for the elective courses, but actually is capped at 40 for your required courses. So the CRIM theory and the research methods, we like to keep those lower. We offer them twice a year so that we can have um, more, mm, have closer connections develop with our students and certainly take advantage of opportunities to develop skills. In third year, we're capping CRIM courses at 40 people now and in fourth year at 20 people. Now, what that means is that if you are just sort of casually taking CRIM, your options are very limited down to those first year courses and then you have to uh, consider some options as second year. Uh, going into third and fourth year courses won't be all that open to you unless you really want to make this um, an area of study. Having said that, for our students who are CRIM majors, 
it really varies. I know that my policing course is very popular. We certainly see a lot of students come to this program who are interested in being police officers. And I actually think that this is an exceptional program for students to consider when they have that sort of career goal. The reason is, is that when you go to a larger institution, and certainly I attended large institutions with you know, hundreds of students in classes, it's very hard for your faculty members to get to know you. Uh, when I teach at Lakehead, I have the opportunity to get to know students in a much more detailed capacity across multiple courses. And it allows me to be able to do something very important for them, and that's write a detailed reference letter to say something about not just what grade they got, but what their performance level is in terms of things like integrity, ability to articulate, ability to be consistent. These are things that are very important for quality reference letters and particularly for policing. So I do know that we have a lot of students who find that course interesting and very relevant to going out and making connections in the field. Um, the field exposure course is one that hasn't yet started because of the fact that it's just been developed since I joined here, but I think it's going to be immensely popular. It's gonna be required so everyone has to take it by the time they're in fourth year. Uh, but just the opportunity to make those networks with practitioners. And then also another big component of that course is developing a professional portfolio. So developing a resume, developing a cover letter, learning where it is you can look for jobs, doing practice interviews, that's the whole background that's going into the idea of this course. Other ones that I think students tend to find very interesting are our social justice courses. So we very routinely see those second year courses, uh, gender and crime, race, ethnicity and crime, youth and crime, that's another one that we offer in second year that all are really popular and uh, we usually always offer them online in the spring and summer semesters, which we are right now. Those are some of the really popular ones I'd say. Awesome. Um, so we do have a question actually, and this ties in really well with uh, what you were chatting about, how um, at Lake had been in smaller class environments. Uh, students are able to connect with their professors and yep. potentially get really, really great reference letters to then go yeah. on to future careers. So the question comes from Hector. It says, I want to know what jobs can I get uh, with a major in criminology? So uh, what sort of careers, career paths and fields do graduates of the criminology program typically go into in your experience? That's a really good question. A nice thing about criminology is that it opens up a lot of career opportunities. So I like to often think about it because I have a lot of students who come here who are interested in a practitioner uh, job tied to the criminal justice system. And so I think of that in terms of the front end of the criminal justice system, in the criminal justice system, and the back end. So on the front end of the criminal justice system, we certainly see, see students go into um, community-oriented care facilities. So what I'm talking about, they're group homes for youth who uh, are unable to live with family members. This is an area that we certainly see people join uh, the workforce in. So trying ideally to divert youth from um, coming in conflict with the law because youth who are in these sort of living arrangements are at a higher risk of becoming in conflict with the law. Then in terms of the criminal justice system itself, certainly as I already mentioned, we have a number of students here who are interested in policing and have gone on to policing. Uh, so one of my students who did an excellent honors thesis with me two years ago is now employed with the Ontario Provincial Police, for example. Corrections, so going into correctional facilities uh, is another area that we see students go into. And I will mention just here, the idea of going on to law school to become a lawyer. That's something that's very popular amongst our students as well. And I'll just take this moment to say that again, the same way that I pitched the value of this university for students interested in policing, I'll pitch it for students who are interested in law school and or graduate school, professional schools of any variety. When you have the opportunity to work closely with professors, you have the opportunity to focus on developing your skills in a way that makes you most attractive to graduate schools or professional schools. And that means higher grades. That you're able to really build up your skill sets and look very attractive to those institutions. Uh, continuing on, so we've looked at the front end of the criminal justice system, being in the criminal justice system, now the back end. 
So people going on to jobs to be a probation officer, for instance, working with victim services agencies. I have an excellent student who is now partnered with our So Simcoe Victim Services Agency locally, and that's such a great resource. We also have, I mentioned before, restorative justice. Well, those sort of programs are operated through um, agencies like the Elizabeth Fry Society, the John Howard Society, the Boys and Girls Club. These are all places that we see uh, criminology graduates go on to. Now, when you get a little bit more removed from the criminal justice system, because in reality, what you've got here is a social science degree that demonstrates that you have an interest in this facet of our social system to do with crime or you know, effects associated with crime. And that can also be, how do we manage a society in a way that reduces crime? So we certainly see people go on with criminology degrees to all facets of government from the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. So ministries at the provincial and federal level are places that students can certainly find exceptional work. Uh, going on to focus on policy-oriented um, jobs, including, for example, Statistics Canada, working for the Ministry of uh, Corrections and Community Services. These are all excellent opportunities, and the list really does go on and on. Uh, it's a broad range of opportunities that we hope that you're able to springboard into from the CRIM program. Awesome. Thank you. I think you covered that amazing. Um, you really went into detail and I love the touch on kind of continuing your education and the fact that um, we do see quite a few students that graduate out of the criminology program continue on within uh, going to law school, mm -hmm. going to graduate studies, and then there's also the option of doing teacher's education and uh, yeah. becoming a teacher within the Canadian education system and more importantly, Ontario. I know um, maybe Patrick could even speak to the teacher's education um, system in Ontario kind of being world renowned and those connections that we have. I won't put you on the spot, Patrick, right now. Um, we will be having a Teachers Education Faculty Friday uh, coming up in the next few months. We hope to be doing this for quite a while still. Um, so please, like I've said before, stay connected with us on our social media and check your email for regular updates for future webinars. Um, because we're always adding um, appointments to our roster and we're also always diversifying kind of the, the faculties, the programs, the departments that we're meeting and covering to help you um, make your decision and make sure that Lakehead is the right choice for you. So um, continuing on with our guided uh, chat, I know that you have already chatted um, about experiential learning opportunities, especially with the new fourth year course that uh, was recently developed. Could, could you also chat about uh, a student's typical research opportunities in criminology? Yeah, so in a fourth year, we have a designated course that students have the option to take. And you actually not only have the option, but you need to be performing at a particular level. You need to have a 75% average in your CRIM courses to get into this. Um, and what it is, is a capstone research project. There's two different ways to take this course. One is um, that you don't have a specific supervisor, and so you join the class, you have you know, the sufficient average, and you have an interest in research. You join the class, there's uh, an instructor, one of our permanent faculty members, an excellent um, psychologist, criminologist, Dr. Danny Krupp, he's taught it the last two years. Um, and he gives everyone a thorough walkthrough of sort of research methods, uh, well, a reminder on that from our previous years, and then helps students develop a research project that they're interested in uh, without imposing too much of the direction in terms of a particular topic, because the goal is in that, that you, you want to really let the student do something they're interested in because they um, haven't partnered with a faculty member. So that's option one. It's available to everybody, you know, need to hook a faculty member into supervising you. The second option, uh, which I complete every year with students, is um, more of an independent study version of that research project. And so it is uh, not just a capstone research project, it's a thesis. And students, when they partner with an individual supervisor for their thesis, you're going to be partnering with someone uh, in terms of a faculty member that has a research 
focus that you're interested in. So it does get more narrowed. Certainly for me, I mentioned already that my research focuses around policing. As well, it's got to do with data collection technologies, so surveillance technologies that legal authorities use. And then I also have a specialization in restorative justice. So students who have these sorts of topic interests can come to me and work with me if they are interested in them. This year, I had three students complete independent projects with me. Two of them worked with data that I collected from what I called vulnerable victims. These were survivors of sexual assault and or domestic violence. And I conducted last summer interviews with um, these victims, 33 victims, and uh, shared subsets of those interviews. So I didn't expect these fourth year students who were excellent students, but this would be a lot for any fourth year student to do, to work with all three of those, we picked a subset. So they've worked with seven interviews and they analyze that data in a qualitative sense, which is something you'd learn about in second year in your CRIM research methods course. But the point is, is that they tried to understand across those interviews, what was consistent in what um, these victims said, and in particular, we were talking about police use of body-worn cameras. What were these victims' concerns and hopes for police use of body-worn cameras? So those were research projects that I had two students do. And then in a different sort of vein, um, so that you hear about someone reading interview transcripts and trying to understand what's consistent across these different interview transcripts. Well, there's also a vein of research called quantitative research, and this is where we don't focus so much on the richness of meaning that people say through words, but instead statistical counts, tabulating up how often something happens, when something happens because of something else. So looking for these very clear causal relationships. I had a student who worked with me on some data I'd collected around the effects of body-worn cameras on prosecution outcomes, so court outcomes. Did we see court outcomes resolved to more pro-prosecution resolutions when body-worn camera footage was used versus when it was not used. So that was another research project I had a student work on this year. So those are some of the areas that they certainly work on with me, but we have other faculty members whose areas of research include the evolution of violence. So this is sort of the psychological development process of violence, uh, psychopathic personalities, so certainly you can see um, a real crim contingent there around um, psychology. And then we have persons who also work in the area of you know, occupational understandings of um, sociology that are relevant to criminology uh, as well. So yeah, that's uh, some areas we see faculty members willing to research students in. Awesome. Thank you for covering that. And also to speak to, obviously, those are, like Alana said, the capstone research projects within criminology. Um, but within almost every single course, if correct me if I'm wrong, probably every course within criminology, there are uh, different theoretical and case study based research projects that tie Absolutely. Into yes. Um, so I have a few more questions here. Uh, and then I, I just want to be mindful of time. So it is uh, 10 to 11 uh, for Eastern Standard Time or Thunder Bay Time, I like to call it. Uh, <laughs> so for any of our students that are, are joining us live, please, I do encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A. Um, if you are watching on Facebook Live, you can also comment. We have our experts behind the scenes answering those. If you are watching this as a recording, I do encourage you to still comment on that video. Um, and our team, after the fact, are always monitoring those videos for any of those questions that come through after the fact. Um, but kind of to end off today's discussion, I wanted to pass it off to Alana to give you the opportunity to kind of chat about your research and so that some of the passions that you focused on. Sure. <laughs> I always love to talk about my research. Oh. <laughs> so um, when I had finished my PhD, I was really interested in relationships that legal authorities, so I think about that broadly, certainly encompasses police, but it can encompass other groups like security guards, like border guards. How are relationships with legal authorities and the public affected by the use of technology? And I'm really focused there on data collection technologies. So certainly um, when we cross borders, it's an excellent example. For those of us who've been crossing borders for a longer time period, 
we have this recollection of a time when technology wasn't a very central component of border crossing. And now it's very clear that the idea of providing a passport that can include biometric components, being asked to provide your fingerprints, being asked to provide iris scans, these are increasingly common, being asked to provide temperature. Um, I was very interested in how the use of technology affects these relations between our legal authorities and the public that they interact with. And the reason there is that, you know, it's one thing, of course, legal authority is an authority, but there's a balance between being an authority uh, that's able to connect with subordinates in respectful ways in neutral ways, in ways that are perceived as fair. All of these things are incredibly important to having um, a positive relationship between the public and legal authorities in a way that promotes a more um, docile, happy society. Now that was the broad theme that I worked with in my PhD. And I really got to hone that into police when I went and lived in Chicago. I had the opportunity to work with the Chicago Police Department on their body-worn cameras pilot project. And that made me so incredibly passionate about policing, um, particularly because honestly, I feel that there's a lot of uh, negative comments around police. And you know, certainly I think that it's fair to be critical, but you should be critical with the intention of improvement. And so that's what I try to focus my research on. What are ways in which we see the need for police community relations to improve? If we introduce technology, do we see improvements? What are ways in which the technology might actually damage those relations to feel heavily surveilled is perhaps something that can make um, members of our community, particularly when we start to think about a social justice perspective, members that have historically poor relations with, uh, with police may feel less comfortable with these sort of surveillance technologies. So these are, I'd say in the broad sense, what I work on. A lot of my opportunities when I've come back to Ontario now is partnering with our Canadian services on helping them evaluate projects related to the use of surveillance technology. So body-worn cameras certainly, um, but branching into other areas including you know, drones, automated license plate recognition, as some other key topics and then just more broadly the transition to digital evidence management you know police services are catching up when it comes to uh, how digital our world has become and i think in the next few years we're going to see uh, all evidence that police deal with move into a, a digital storage format and that is very interesting when we think about things like algorithms that are able to sort through and make predictions about that data um, some of which intuitively seems obviously positive in terms of looking for connections between dots, but then also can become highly oppressive when we're not monitoring it carefully and uh, requiring transparency from our legal authorities. So there, uh, that's where I'll end it. <laughs> awesome. No, I'm, I'm happy that you got to cover that because I certainly find that interesting and it's, it's great to hear um, kind of what the professors are doing at Lakehead and what our faculty members are doing. So oftentimes students uh, go in with the perception of professors just teach, that they're here yeah. to share their knowledge, of course, but teach a class and that's all they do. They, they can only do meetings and they can only grade my work, but lots of our professors at Lake and our faculty members, um, and they're doing such important research that has such significant um, importance within the community, within the broader, um, I guess you could say, world, because, I mean, studies are, are being published by, and articles and publications are being put out by our faculty members that are being recognized by some really amazing people and really important people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something to speak on, because obviously, when, you, when you're investing in your future, when you're investing in your education, you want to ensure that the people that are giving you that knowledge and teaching you and that are guiding you in that are actually <laughs> renowned and they are recognized within their own field. So thank you so much for touching on your research opportunities. Um, so I'll take this opportunity to kind of remind the viewers, if you do have any questions, we have a few more minutes, I'll start my wrap up. But if I see any questions pop up, we'll be happy to jump over to those. Um, 
Otherwise, I'll take this uh, chance to kind of speak to, again, reminding everyone to follow us on our social media. So we do have a Facebook page. It's Lakehead University International. Um, I do want to dive into the Facebook page specifically because we have a group on that page. It's called the Lakehead University Incoming Class of 2020. So we have over 150 students that are on that group already. Um, and they're having great conversations about um, housing options, uh, classmates, people that they're meeting in their own city. So I've already seen people from, uh, for example, Hyderabad, India, that have already started connecting with each other uh, back home before they even arrive at Lake. And so establishing that familiarization, that friendship with people before they come uh, and setting up that comfort zone almost. We also have Instagram, Lake and International. So every Tuesday and Thursday, we do do an in we do an Instagram Live at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, and we meet a current student. So next Tuesday, we are meeting a student in mechanical engineering. His name is Silvius. He is from Malaysia. And then on Thursday next week, we are going to meet a current student in chemistry. Her name is Bright, and she is from Nigeria. So we, we definitely have lots of... Um, Lots of opportunities to explore all the different offerings at Lakehead, but also get to hear an authentic experience. So um, we've had these students, we work with them so that they can answer your questions live and also share some of the details that they've, uh, some of their living experiences, their academic experience, student life, clubs, all that sort of stuff. We've really picked people that have been involved in the community um, and can share their experience and kind of give you a good sneak peek at what you can do here at Lakehead. Um, lastly, we have a Twitter, Lakehead INTL, and then YouTube. So we are a general YouTube account, Lakehead University. Um, but to highlight that, we do have two specific playlists for international students. One is the International Lives, um, and that is where all of the recordings for these type of webinars do end up. Uh, so if you've missed our previous ones, I do encourage you to explore those. Uh, we do have several upcoming for quite a few months now we have already in the in the schedule. And then we just have a general international playlist where you can uh, hear more from other student testimonials. You can learn more about Lakehead just from general videos. Um, there's quite a lot to explore there. So I do encourage you to, again, check out those uh, those channels and those those videos, those photos, those posts, all that stuff to start meeting us and learning more. So like I was saying, we do have a, um, a private Facebook group for all of our incoming students. So it's called Lakehead University Incoming Class of 2020. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the chat right now for those viewers that are joining us live. Um, if you are watching this as a recording though, um, feel free on Facebook if you just simply search Lakehead University Incoming Class of 2020, it will pop up there for you. So for those viewers that are joining live, again, I'll reiterate, it's now in the chat. So I do encourage you to uh, take that and go and join us. Uh, there are a few questions you have to fill out to join the group. And I do uh, want to acknowledge that you have to complete all the questions so that we can verify that you are an incoming student. Um, but otherwise, the last thing I'll touch on here is um, we understand that kind of getting an understanding and getting to see where you're gonna be studying. So the facilities, the surrounding environment, the scenery, all that is a really important part of the decision. Um, so if you take one of our virtual campus tours, we have campus tours for both Aurelia and Thunder Bay. All you have to do is simply visit lakehead.ca forward slash tours um, and you'll, you'll get to explore the campuses, uh, the facilities, residents, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I do hope to see you in the future at one of our future webinars. The next one we have is on Monday, so just a few days away from now, and we will be meeting our residence life team and they will be chatting about all of the uh, living options and accommodation options on campus. Uh, myself and Patrick will be there again and we will do a brief cover on some of the off-campus options too. Well, I'll take this opportunity again to thank Alana, thank Patrick for joining me. I really, really appreciate it. Um, today's discussion was amazing and I couldn't be more grateful for having the support from you guys. Um, and to our viewers, thank you for joining us and uh, sending us your questions. We were really happy to have you and we hope to see you again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I echo that. And for any of the students, prospective students who are watching, please feel free to reach out, 
um, if you have more specific questions, you know, we're very happy to be able to answer them. And I'm not doing a whole lot else right now. So, you know, happy to get those. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, bye for now, everyone.